All right. Well, good morning. I appreciate everybody coming out here on <coughs> our third day of the Sea Air Space Expo. Uh, there are other panels going on, but you are at the best panel. Uh, there's a batch of aviators talking about some unmanned stuff. We don't need to be talking about that. Uh, we're going to be talking about a holistic approach to commercial maritime national security. And uh, with everything in the news, uh, this is a very timely topic, and, and I think I've got four great panelists here to talk about that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Sal Pagliano. I'm the chair of the Department of History, Criminal Justice, and Political Science at beautiful Campbell University in Bowie's Creek, North Carolina. And if you don't know where any of that is, that's not surprising. Uh, just, just south of Raleigh. Uh, I am up here because I have a very little, very small, minuscule YouTube presence that some reason people follow, and uh, they, they invite me up here to do this. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about maritime national security, and I'm going to introduce each of our speakers. Uh, they're going to, about five, ten minutes, do a quick little overview on comments. Uh, I'm going to have a little bit of a Q&A with them, and then, of course, we'll have questions from the audience. Uh, we've got a couple of microphones set up, so we're really looking forward to you participating in this event. Uh, our first speaker today is going to be Vice Admiral P Peter Gautier, the Deputy Commandant of Operations for the U.S. Coast Guard. I think one of the busiest people right now in the Coast Guard, next to Captain O'Connell down in uh, Baltimore. Uh, I think I, I, I've seen uh, Admiral Gautier quite a few times in reference yesterday just in Governor Moore's uh, press conference. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to him, and I'll do each of our introductions as we go down. So, Admiral? Hey, hey thanks very much, Sal, and good morning, everybody. Um, um, and you're very kind in terms of uh, my role in Baltimore, which actually is being done by fabulous folks, um, Coast Guard folks and interagency folks in Unified Command there. But so that means I can be here and, uh, and what, what a great pleasure it is. You know, I, I think just recognizing off the top um, how wonderful that Sea Air Space and the Navy League has recognized the U.S. Merchant Marine Fleet as critical to national security starting with the opening panel with all the service chiefs that included Admiral Phillips, Merritt. Um, so upfront that recognition and then also this panel being evidence and recognition of that um, critically important part element of national security as well. So I, I'm here to represent myself, but as a Coast Guard Vice Admiral, but I am also the son of a merchant mariner. Um, my dad served in World War II on Liberty ships and Victory ships sailing across the world, and so I grew up in a household where it was very evident his frustration that the fact that they carried Navy armed guard on their Liberty ships and Victory ships and did not get veterans credit, even though they were risking their lives every single day in service to the nation. So I am thir thoroughly inculcated in, um, in merchant marine culture and the value of the U.S. merchant marine in terms of national security. And so I think the fact that we're here in sea airspace, sponsored by Navy League, in a national security forum um, starts with the premise that a healthy merchant marine with the capacity and capability to serve when necessary in advancing the logistics to do what the military needs to get done is just a fundamental premise of this conversation. Um, and so what uh, we're talking about, I think, challenges to the U.S. flag industry here. And so um, I'll also start with uh, just a reference to um, Admiral Retired Watson, U.S. Coast Guard, co-author of a book that just got published that articulated that we, in the 1950s, 50% 50 of the global tonnage was U.S. flagged, and now it is 0.4%. So we have a capacity issue against that premise um, right off the front. And so one of the challenges is in terms of U.S. ship building and ship repair capacity. This is something that was a theme day one when um, the CNO and the Commandant talked about the challenges that we experience in terms of the United States Coast Guard and the Navy in terms of capability and capacity for ship construction and ship repair. And that's why um, what Secretary Del Toro is incredibly important in terms of the Government Ship Builders Council, an initiative that was announced at Coast Guard Yard in Curtis Bay, which is now trapped by the, um, the bridge collapse there but how we uh, necessarily so need to advance um, the capacity and capability in U.S. shipbuilding in order to have the kind of capabilities that we need moving on to the future. And, um, I know that others have a lot of expertise here, and I look forward to hearing their comments. 
And then these U.S. flag ships need to be manned. Um, and so there's a question in terms of the health, the capacity, proficiency of the U.S. mariners in order to do what we as military services need to do. The Coast Guard's role here is number one, making sure that um, we remove barriers in terms of the licensing and documentation of the individuals who are seeking a profession and maintaining those professions at sea. So I'm really pleased to say that um, through the National Maritime Center in West Virginia, we have done things like we have discarded aging printers that were largely um, responsible for a backlog over the past several years in order to get those documents done. We've replaced them with laser printers now and the document looks different. Um, and we're gonna continue to invest. We got $11 million in the 2024 bit, um, budget to build something called Navita, which is gonna move us into the 21st century in terms of the processes to get Mariners documented. And um, we look forward to that. And we're looking at other things like taking able-bodied seamen requirements and then um, matching them with how it's done internationally and then reducing the time it takes to be an AB, given that the, um, how we train um, folks is um, much more advanced than it used to be. Then other headwinds to US merchant fleet is the same as the global fleet in that we're operating now in areas of the world that are now contested. Certainly everybody's paying attention to what's going on in the Red Sea. We do, by the way, have US flag deep draft vessels that operate in the Northern Red Sea area. And, um, and so uh, that's a real challenge. And when you look at the 80% change in, at least in container ships that no longer operate through the Red Sea and then have found alternate uh, paths for delivering cargo. And then on the other side, contested waters within the nine dash line. And a couple of years ago where China initiated their maritime law, which requires unlawfully merchant ships to check into China um, if they carry certain cargoes in, in order to meet certain conditions. And then lastly, there's just a very dynamic environment, super competitive environment that US flag and uh, operates in along with the collective international flags. It's a very competitive market, low margins in many cases. And in order to maintain that competition, we've got to keep up with dynamic times. So for example, alternate fuels coming into the forefront. Um, uh, the US uh, and international community negotiated through IMO, as we know, uh, that um, deep draft international shipping by 2020 needs to be net carbon zero. And that means a lot more shipping tonnage is going um, LNG as a bridge to alternate fuels that are emerging in terms of methanol, in terms of hydrogen, in terms of ammonia fuels, even electric, and now even considering nuclear fuels. And when you look at the age of the US flag fleet being on average greater than 25 years old, there's a competitive disadvantage there as we need to continue to keep up with these things. Autonomy is another one that the Coast Guard is paying very close attention to in conjunction with um, all stakeholders who um, are working in this space. And then lastly, cyber. We need to make sure that our cybersecurity is where it needs to be in order to um, maintain safe and secure operations. The first question that we got during the motor ve uh, vessel Dolly casualty was, was it a cyber attack? So the Coast Guard's moved out on a notice of proposed rulemaking and some other um, elements in the executive order that has recently given us more authority to help preserve cybersecurity in the fleet to make sure that we are collectively managing, managing this particular threat. But the important thing is then moving internationally to make sure that we have equivalent standards across all flags so we can maintain a level playing field in terms of competition. Admiral, I appreciate that. We're going to come back with questions uh, as we progress, but I, I really appreciate it. I think it's important always to highlight that first point that you made that, you know, when the U.S. comes out of World War II, it's got the number one Navy in the world. It's got the number one merchant marine in the world. Today, we have the number one Navy, but the number 21 merchant marine in the world. And, and that's been a precipitous decline, whereas China holds number two in almost both those positions. So a def definitely a different interpretation of how sea power is applied. Uh, our second presenter is Vice Admiral uh, Joanna Noonan. Uh, she has changed colors of uniforms just a little bit from her previous uh, role in the Coast Guard to become the 14th Superintendent of the United States Merchant Marine Academy. I'm, I'm always jealous of, of Admiral Noonan going to work every day at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy and staring out across Long Island Sound 
and looking at New York Maritime, the finest maritime academy in the world, right across, <laughs> right across from right across from her every day. So sorry, we'll, we'll, I have to defend my alma mater just a little bit. Uh, but very happy to have Admiral Noonan here, who I get actually to work for as an adjunct professor at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. So got to be careful about my jokes with Admiral Noonan. So Admiral. <laughs> Sal, thank you uh, so much. It is great to be here. I also really appreciate the Navy League hosting this event and having Navy League expertise that have really been on the forefront of these issues. I'm a big fan of Fal Sal's. I love his YouTube channel, uh, What's Going On in Shipping. I hope everybody looks at it. He's now gone viral with all the attention he's gotten with the uh, being a commentator on the bridge uh, collapse. I'm also very happy to be here uh, right next to my classmate from the Coast Guard Academy, Pete Godier. So one correction I am going to make on the slide, I am Rear Admiral, U.S. Coast Guard retired, but a Vice Admiral in the U.S. Maritime Service as the superintendent at Kings Point. So if anybody wants to correct the record on that. Um, so really glad to be here. So I bring you greetings from K Kings Point, home of the United States Merchant Marine Academy, an institution that was formed to answer the call in a national peril and for which 80 years it's been producing young mariners boasting experiences and qualifications unmatched by the graduates of any other academy, federal or state. 25% of our graduates accept active duty commissions in the armed services. The remaining 75% will sail commercially as civilian mariners uh, on military seal of command or commercially. They have uh, unlimited Coast Guard licenses, either third mate um, or third assistant engineer. They must sail for five years on their license on U.S. flagged ships and if they, if they don't go on active duty and have a reserve commission for eight years. Most of my graduates uh, end up going into the Navy Reserve because the Reserve has tailored their reserve program for our Merchant Mariners uh, sailing. Um, talent is a resource we provide. If the United States seeks to grow its flagship industry into something robust, effective, secure, prosperous, and equal to a national emergency, then the effective management of the talent will have to be a priority. So let me clue you into some of the scuttlebutt on the Kings Point campus. I just spoke to a young woman, a second class uh, junior who just came back from her senior training. She was offered not only a job by the company she sailed with, but essentially a lucrative 10-year contract. For five years, she would sail on her license, and for the next five, they would bring her ashore into a management position. So she is seriously considering this offer. And the idea of jobs waiting for our graduates uh, starting junior year is nothing new. Uh, but this reflects a serious effort by this particular company to address their personnel challenges over the long term. Attractive arrangements are the direction that companies must take if they want to compete for talent. People want to have reliable schedules and reasonable deployments. Some of my graduates from last year have taken jobs that allow them to live anywhere they want, be flown overseas to meet their ship for each assignment. They seek work-life balance and upward mobility. And speaking of Admiral Phillips and the Maritime Administration, they are actually hosting a Mariner's Work-Life Symposium coming up in DC on April 16th. So I'm really excited that she's doing that to bring people together to have some of these conversations. So I can hear some of the cynics groan, you know, kids nowadays, they're soft, they don't want to work. And I can assure you, this is not the case. Uh, my folks are varsity athletes, they're scholars who pack a four year Bachelor of Science degree into three and spend uh, an additional year at sea in apprenticeships. And they obtain their, you know, professional credentials, you know, at the age of 22. They graduate with a very high expectation for themselves. And I would say they simply have the audacity to hold similarly high expectations for their leaders. So the greatest peril awaits those who neglect talent management. Remember, the only merchant mariners beholden to go to war are those in the reserve. However, in the US Navy, 80% of the reserve strategic sea lift officers leave at the end of their eight year commitment. So as today's discussion begins, I remain to be convinced that the American Merchant Marine can incentivize itself into, a ro into robust shape. The only answer in this time of peril is quite likely a White House level strategic reckoning that will rally the technology, manufacturing, military, and commercial shipping sectors into reestablishing our dominance as a maritime nation. And I believe our survival depends upon that. 
Those forward-looking companies who have managed their talent well and followed sound business practices will be in the best position to gain from these new opportunities. They'll certainly have the people they need to ban a growing fleet. Other companies, not so much. I'd like to partner with the Navy Reserve on their talent management plan for strategic sea lift officers because we cannot afford to lose 80% of them at the eight year mark. So, and I look forward to talking more. I, I think it's so important to, to note that uh, Merchant Marine cadets are out there on a daily basis, sailing on ships, doing, you know, while other, other students and colleges are off on spring break and summer vacations, they're out there sailing ships. I had a contacted because of my YouTube channel from a parent of, of one of Admiral Newton's cadets who was out there in the Red Sea asking about what, what's going on, are, are they safe? I'm so worried about them. And again, they were out there doing their job. They were, they were out there, they were, they were number one protected by the US Navy, they were absolutely safe out there. But just to know that they were out there doing that job and we forget exactly that it's the Merchant Marine Academy that has the battle standard for losing cadets during World War II. And I think it's a really important element on the training aspect that we're gonna come back to. Uh, next we have uh, John McCowan. If you do not know John, I don't know, you must be living under a rock somewhere. But, uh, <laughs> the, the, John uh, is with Blue Alpha uh, Capital, but he's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Center for Maritime Strategy. Uh, John's monthly newsletter on container shipping is a must read. If, if you don't get it, I look forward to getting my note from John every month that gives me my, my, makes me look smart when I talk about uh, container shipping. Uh, he knows the commercial side better than almost any other human I know that's out there from both experiencing it and being an active participant in it. So John. Thank you, Sal. Um, I, I've been uh, on the commercial side of shipping for four decades and um, I've seen a lot of changes during that period. Um, I, I, I would say the past few years though, um, I'm seeing a transition uh, to kind of use a, a pun, a real sea change in terms of, of policymakers kind of realizing that we need to do something with our merchant marine. Um, uh, you know, there are a whole bunch of factors that kind of play into that, uh, just as there were factors that um, uh, played into kind of the government moving away. If you go back a number of decades ago, uh, uh, the government, uh, uh, you know, moved away and, and there are factors that I think are, you, I, I disagree with them, but they're understandable. It was kind of the uh, Soviet Union, uh, you know, kind of was dismantled. There was kind of a view that technology would, uh, you know, perhaps change the uh, priority of something like sea lift, uh, you know, wouldn't be big conventional wars. So, so those factors were, um, uh, uh, again, understandable and led to this change. Um, my sense is the last few years, we're seeing a, a, a stronger move in the opposite direction. And here again, it's, it's factors, kind of tangible factors that people can point to. Um, uh, obviously pretty high on the list is China. Uh, uh, you know, China and its uh, kind of saber rattling relative to Taiwan. Um, you know, and I think people, uh, you go back a while and China was led into the WTO and there was a view that they're capitalist and we trade with people and uh, everything's gonna be, be fine. And particularly with the most recent uh, president, uh, people are realizing, you know, oh my gosh, it's a capitalist system, but they have some uh, military ambitions. Uh, and then uh, uh, that's not the only one, that's certainly a big one, but here you have um, Russia is kind of, um, uh, kind of recreating or seems to have, we have a president in Russia that seems to have a goal of recreating the Soviet Union just with a different brand, it's called Russia. Uh, and, and, and we have another uh, uh, kind of tangible factor that reminded people that, that big conventional wars aren't, aren't over with what Russia is doing in Ukraine. And then on top of that, uh, a whole different reason, but Russia's early difficulties uh, you know, were all about logistics. So all of those are coming together to make policymakers realize that um, uh, we've, we've got to really make sure under any circumstance that we have necessary sea lift capacity. 
And I have a view that, you know, up and down the entire maritime chain, we need to look at that. Um, but the, the, the simple approach that, that I kind of take is um, the focus should be on what is going to lead to more billets for our crane mariners, and, and most particularly international billets, and, uh, uh, because that's what we need to work with. If you kind of solve for that, you know, you have um, spots for people coming out of our academies, um, a lot of the other things kind of take care of themselves. And uh, one of the, the great programs recently that was enacted that I think should be a model for what we look at going forward is the tanker security program. You know, there the, the military took a hard look and realized, wow, we're really short of the tankers we need to refuel our vessels. And the 10 tankers that were approved for that program, um, uh, you know, could play a very key role. And, and yes, there's a lot of, uh, you know, it's $5 million per tanker per year. But if you put all those numbers together and you kind of look at our defense budget, you say, it, you know, it's 24 hours a day, that is literally, you know, 30 minutes worth of our, our defense budget. So I think that... Um, uh, programs like that, targeting, you know, Pacific needs, uh, you know, a uh, uh, case can be made that we need more tankers, uh, uh, things like row-row vessels that, uh, you know, have utility. So I think, I think when we look at the government funds, um, it, it should be looked at in, in what's the smart, most efficient way of government support that kind of lends to the most positions. And, and there you kind of, when you use that as a template, you um, uh, kind of focus on a couple of sectors where the crewing cost isn't uh, a, a large, uh, isn't the biggest percentage of the total cost. And there, one, one area that clearly jumps out at you there is LNG shipping. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that, you know, with our increasing LNG exports, there should be some sort of requirement that some of that move on U.S. flag. I know there's an initiative to have us both build LNG vessels and crew them. Um, when I look at that, I kind of, the numbers tell me that for the same support it would take to, to build one LNG vessel, uh, you could have like uh, 12 foreign-built vessels but crewed with American. So I think something like that makes sense. Uh, the container space is another one. Uh, you know, when I started my career, there were uh, at least three very dominant U.S. flag container shipping companies that went all over. Uh, we, we don't have any participation there. Uh, there, too, I think that there's some, some real possibilities. I've, I've tried to promote to my friends at uh, J.B. Hunt that uh, the real opportunity for them is to uh, perhaps look at starting a 53-foot container service from China to the U.S. And if you go through the numbers, um, uh, 40, more than 40% of our containers come from China, and uh, uh, it makes sense for those to move in 53s, uh, because if you have 53-foot containers, you're taking um, less moves to load and unload the vessel, but a very a key part, um, when, when freight hits the West Coast and it, and it goes long distance across the country, um, it, it, it almost always will, will be transitioned into 53s. You know, 340s become 253s, and the cost and time to do that works with the uh, 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 domestic uh, 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 transportation system. So if you take that step out of the process, um, the cost savings are many times what the differential U.S. crewing costs are. Um, I, I don't think uh, one of the existing carriers would think about doing that, but uh, there's an opportunity for a new entrant uh, that kind of says, well, I'm going to do it different, and I'm going to, and, and we know that U.S. flag can have marketing advantages. It certainly did in the past, so uh, Amazon would be a great candidate for doing that. So I think um, I, I could see an initiative where the U.S. government kind of said, well, we're going to promote somebody doing something like that, and we're going to give them a say a five-year subsidy because we think once they start they'll see themselves a, a further added benefit of moving freight from china and 53s is you're going to kind of decongest a lot of the congestion related to our ports on the west coast where truck drivers going to a terminal taking it a few miles away to be transloaded and so you take that step out 
So that, that's just touching on some of the things, but I, but I think we, uh, getting back to the key point should be, what are the initiatives that lead to the most additional spots for our crane mariners? Because they're, they're key. Uh, uh, but there, there are other things we need to look at, but if you solve for that, you solve the, the big problem. Thanks, John. Uh, we're missing one member on our panel today. Mr. Greg Pulaski, unfortunately, uh, cannot be here because of an issue. Greg is the Director of Total Force Management and Military Sealift Command. And I just want to mention one thing real quick about uh, Greg and Military Sealift Command. This year marks the 75th anniversary of Military Sealift Command, uh, founded on October 1st of 1949, which coincidentally is the same day the People's Republic of China is founded. Weird coincidence. Uh, but MSC represents uh, an amazing force multiplier for the US Navy uh, with roughly around 5,500 civil service mariners, they crew about 20% of the US Navy. They are the largest single employer of merchant mariners that we have out there. And I, I think it's always important to have them in there. Uh, last but not least, by any measure, is uh, of course, Mr. Mike Roberts. He is another non-resident fellow with the Center of Maritime uh, Studies. I don't know how they, I need to become a non-resident fellow. It sounds like a good job. Uh, <laughs> Mike has a amazing background when it comes to the maritime sector. Uh, he's going to be uh, talking about uh, the uh, current situation of it. He's right now over at Hudson Institute and doing a lot on advocating for the merchant marine and sea power. So, Mike. Thank you, Sal, and thank you to the Navy League for having this panel and including me on it. Um, I really appreciate the comments of, of my colleagues here uh, on issues I certainly agree wholeheartedly with. I think that from my perspective, uh, the, the starting point is understanding that the concerns that we've been talking about for the last 40, 50 years uh, as to the importance of having an American maritime industry uh, were mostly hypothetical. They were, what if, what if, what if? It, it's real now. It, it's real, real now. China has an overwhelming uh, commercial maritime industry, both sh uh, shipbuilding and, and shipping. And, 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 and we have to kind of, with a real sense of urgency, in my opinion, come out of uh, sort of the mindset that we've been working under for, for so long and, and get real about coming up with solutions that are both timely and at a realistic scale to respond to the threat. So uh, uh, John mentioned the tanker security program, which I completely agree with is great. We added 10 ships uh, last year with that. That's a good start, but at that rate, we're not gonna get to where we need to go uh, to, to respond in a timely fashion to where we're at. So I have a, a five minute version of a, a slide deck um, uh, that uh, is really part of a much longer uh, conversation in the, in the sort of the, the opening line is in no strategically important sector. Is China's advantage over the US more pronounced than in the commercial maritime industry. And I'm also sp speaking about both the, the defense industrial base, mariners and sh US shipbuilding capability and, and ship repair. So I have a few slides to illustrate that overmatch and then a few more to, to summarize a possible solution. Next slide, and I can do that all myself, that's great. Um, the graphic on the t to the top right should be familiar to, to many of you. The uh, shipbuilding China's shipbuilding capacity is absolutely overwhelming compared to ours and compared to most of the rest of the world. Uh, the figures to the left are from uh, BRS brokerage. Uh, this year, China uh, has 58.1% of the uh, commercial order book. That's up from 50.6% a year ago. Uh, it's not stopping, it's not slowing down. South Korea is down to 23.5%, 13.5% for Japan. The rest of the world, less than 5%. That's EU, US, Philippines, Vietnam. Uh, uh, China, the, China has followed the clear classic military value of, of using that commercially uh, fed uh, industrial base to uh, build up its Navy. Uh, similar story on the commercial fleet. Um, uh, the, uh, China and Hong Kong owes, owns over 10,600 uh, large cargo ships in the world fleet, about one in five cargo ships in the, in the, in the fleet, registers almost two-thirds of them in China or Hong Kong, meaning Chinese nationals are on the bridge. Most of the rest of the global fleet are open registry, uh, flag of convenience, ships captains having no loyalty <coughs> to any particular nation. America has about 100 
U.S. flag, U.S. crewed ships in international trade. Uh, the other 670 in the dark blue there are in U.S. domestic trades, and the fleet is much too small today to meet basic resupply needs in a Western Pacific conflict. Next slide. Uh, this is a picture of ports. Um, uh, China has complete or partial control over marine terminals in 23 of the top 25 ports. This includes many maritime choke points, but in, even in this graphic, it does not cover Chinese investments in other choke points like both ends of the Panama Canal and in, Jipu, in Djibouti. If you think about the last two slides together, the, the, the amount of, uh, of the size of the fleet, the Chinese controlled fleet, mostly controlled by, uh, on the bridge by Chinese uh, mariners, and the, the control they have over ports around the world at virtually every maritime choke point, uh, they are in a position to inflict potentially devastating damage to the global economy, or specifically uh, the U.S. economy, by turning off or turning down maritime logistics supply chains if they chose to do so. Hopefully, they never see it in their interest to do so, but they have the power to do that. And, and simply having that power is a real concern, I believe, to American economic security. So can we do anything about this? We've free traded this industry away almost completely. Uh, how do we get it back? How do we start to move back uh, and not start, but move back briskly and, and at, at scale? And I think the answer to that is yes, we can. <laughs> using the maritime security program, the tanker secure, security program at design as our model. Um, the main driver uh, of change here is simply to recognize that the commercial sea lift fleet, US flag, US crewed ships should be much larger than it has been uh, to this point. It should be at least 250 ships. Uh, we've talked about 10 to 20 tankers, uh, the studies indicate at least 80, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's over 100 tankers that we need to fight in a, in a Western Pacific um, uh, conflict. Um, that's just to cover military mobility uh, requirements, not uh, allied uh, mobility, not civilian populations. It's the, most, it's the same criteria that uh, have been governing our, our uh, fleet for, for decades. Um, so we have developed a plan using the uh, maritime security uh, program as the model, and this is a hard slide to follow, but this is how you get from uh, uh, 85 ships at the beginning of last year to 250 U.S. flag, U.S. crewed ships, and 500 U.S. controlled ships overall by the end of the decade. Um, most would agree that the maritime security program has been a very good program, very effective, but it was configured to meet much, much smaller threats than we have today. If we add just 30 U.S. flagships, U.S. crewed ships per year, 1,200 mariners, and that's a lot, but it's doable. Um, we can get to almost 200 ships by the close of the Davidson window at the end of 2027, and 250 ships by the end of the decade. If we create a new second registry, and add another 250 ships operating in commercial trades, but under contract to the US government, it would take that many ships off the board for the bad guys and, and strengthen our economic security against the kinds of concerns that I, we, that I mentioned around port control and, and the size of the Chinese fleet. So I'm aware of maritime labor's concerns that this might dilute support for US citizens' crews. I respect that. On balance, I believe those concerns are more than offset by a variety of factors, most importantly, the country's very strong interest in better protecting our peacetime maritime supply chains. The key point here is that fleet expan expansion, fleet expansion of the US flag fleet can happen quickly by reflagging open registry ships to uh, the US flag in existing trades. And, and this, um, John mentioned the, the tanker security program. This is a report that came out uh, co-branded with the Center for Maritime Strategy and the Hudson Institute last October. Pictures on the front are of two tankers that were uh, Stena owned and operated under foreign flag. They're now US flagships. We just need to scale that up planfully as much as we can with the right ship types and in the right deployments. Um, this can happen. Um, next slide. Next slide, there we go. Now. We can also leverage this fleet 
to grow and modernize our commercial shipbuilding industry by providing a consistent demand signal that U.S. shipyards will deliver, say 15 commercial ships each year, tankers, container ships, railroads, whatever. Not a Navy acquisition program, but using private sector builders, construction, private sector construction managers to produce commercially viable uh, ships to be deployed in, in of the types and, de and deployments in international markets that would be deemed most useful to U.S. national and economic security. And then the last slide for now um, is reforms. Not surprisingly, going from 82 ships under the current program between CSP, MSP, and, and uh, TSP uh, to 250 ships will drive, the, the economics don't work the same. So we, that re requires some program reforms. Uh, the most significant program reform uh, recommended here is that we uh, have a competitive bidding process for slots in the program, say seven-year contracts. Uh, what is envisioned are bid teams of U.S. carriers, U.S. foreign carriers, U.S. shipyards, maybe a foreign shipyard, tech partners, the government setting basic specs, and then these bid teams making proposals for 30 slots per year for a ramp-up period of five years. Um, uh, the contracts would then be awarded on a best value basis, not lowest price technically acceptable. Best value basis. Um, that, uh, that's the main takeaway I hope from this is that we can do this. We don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, or keep wringing our hands over the lack of a U.S. industrial base or U.S. flag commercial fleet. This program would work and work quickly and at a scale much more closely matching the threats we now face. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to do my prerogative of asking a question of each of our panelists, and then we will open it up to the audience here for questions. So, Admiral, one of the missions the Coast Guard has, and I think it's a very unheralded mission, is number one, be our representative to the International Maritime Organization, and also have young Coast Guardsmen go on board vessels and do port state control. Obviously, the issue of the Dolly has been uh, in the forefront of the news recently. We've just witnessed a U.S. port basically be taken out by a vessel. Uh, about 3% import exports come in and out of the port of Baltimore. But uh, we've seen issues with ships coming in and out of ports for quite a while. Right now, we had Ever Forward two years ago. Uh, we just had APL Qingdao lose power coming out of uh, the Howland Hook Terminal in Staten Island in the kills. Uh, fortunately, there were tugs there able to get the vessel out. We had Mare Surabaya last year coming in the Savannah, lose power. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the Coast Guard, and more importantly for our security issues, you know, what do we need to do uh, in terms of both the IMO and standards for vessels worldwide, and how much more we need to promote that mission that the Coast Guard does. Again, the Coast Guard has 11 missions, and it's a lot. It's a lot for an organization the size of the Coast Guard to do the inspections. We just saw the Port mm -hmm. State Control report come out. They did about eight, 9,000 inspections, which is just unbelievable number for them to do. I was wondering if you can contextualize that a little bit and talk a little sure, bit. Sure, Sal. And, and there's, a lot, there's a lot to your question there. So let me just start with um, broad acknowledgement about the safety of international shipping. I mean, broadly, um, deep draft shipping is absolutely safe, one of the safest modes of transportation, the safest when you look at tonnage, uh, you know, number of individuals carried on any given day in and out of ports. We have thousands and thousands of foreign flag vessels, U.S. flag vessels, making port calls in the U.S. safely and securely. I got asked this question by the White House Press Corps when I um, sort of just a couple hours ahead of time discovered that I was going to be on the podium there with Secretary Buttigieg um, making that particular case. But nevertheless, um, uh, as the investigation continues, we know that we need to continue to get better. We do suffer, um, and not infrequently, losses of propulsion and losses of steering in any given U.S. port. Um, what happened with um, the do motor vessel do Dolly, what we saw on the video with the complete loss of electrical power is indeed quite, quite rare. Um, but we have some work to do internationally, especially when we get NTSB findings um, in order to make ourselves better there. But I think there's another theme and answer to your question um, from the lessons that we, we've been learning. We, we need to advance standards internationally. Um, in order to maintain competitiveness with the U.S. flag, we know that we, uh, U.S. Coast Guard doesn't need to overburden, so to speak, the U.S. flag um, fleet with regulations that are specific to the United States. 
So that's why we're taking the lessons that we're learning, say, for cybersecurity, and then in alternate fuels, emerging technologies, we're doing individual use cases with partners in um, the private sector where we can do things like um, produce a certificate of inspection for a hydrogen powered ferry. And then our goal here is once we get some sets and reps with that, we are gonna go to International Maritime Organization and forge international rules. So everybody's playing um, under the same rules. You know, the other lesson though, in terms of port disruption that we have from Baltimore that the Coast Guard has been thinking about more and more is, what does a major port disruption look like if we had an overseas contingency. We tend to think solely about an away game, um, the potential for a Taiwan conflict, which is absolutely gonna be contingent on US flag sea lift in order to sustain. We cannot fool ourselves in thinking that that conflict will be short and only with organic resources in the Pacific theater. It will need to be resupplied. But then there is also an, an all domain conflict we need to think about how we have a robust and resilient maritime transportation system here, hardened with cyber. And um, you know, looking at things like the potential for espionage and sabotage that we have seen in past conflicts, which could do things like take down a bridge and close a waterway for a considerable amount of time. Thanks for answering that. Uh Admiral Noonan, you are training young merchant mariners. We are producing both at the Merchant Marine Academy and the State Academies you know, thousands of, of third mates, third assistant engineers every year. Yet we have consistent testimony from uh, both the maritime administrators, present and past, commanders of Transportation Command about potential shortages of, of mariners. And one of the things that I think has always heralded the U.S. Merchant Marine when it is in a period of advancement is it's on the forefront of technological advantages, you know, whether it's the introduction of oil propulsion in the United States all the way back to the clipper ships coming in. You know, we're looking at this big change going on in the commercial industry with fuels that Emma Gautier just talking about. We're talking about new propulsions, LNG, green methanol. You know, what can we do at both Merchant Marine Academy, other state academies that can really put us in a position where American merchant mariner engineers in particular are sought after and helps us with getting those merchant mariners, not just jobs out in the merchant marine, but advancing their licenses, getting up to that mid-level and upper level where we have critical shortages right now. I think that uh, Kings Point and the State Maritime Academies are looking for those opportunities to do that. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned is that one of the things that our you know, cadets at sea get is on the job training. So during their second year at Kings Point, uh, our Midshipmen, when they're at sea, they're called cadets. They get an entire trimester at sea, either on military sea lift command or commercial shipping. So they're actually getting to use and learn on ships that are actually using the technologies. When you come back to the classrooms at our uh, state and federal academies, I think we are looking at ways that we can really expand. So whether that's you know some of the concepts on maritime centers of excellence, uh, some of the academies are like looking at wind. Uh, we bring in experts to talk on, you know, different issues. We have capstone and scholar projects that our midshipmen get to really explore with uh, advisors in depth on some of these issues. I would say what Kings Point does exceptionally well is just the foundations. So the program that uh, we have at Kings Point is very rigorous. In fact, a lot of our graduates say the hardest thing they ever did in their life was graduate from Kings Point. Uh, we have... Uh, fairly you know, specific majors, we have five majors, three are involving marine engineering and two are on the marine transportation side. Uh, some of our folks are graduating with like 188 credit hours, which is insane. And uh, partly how we squeeze in all of that is because we're in trimesters. Uh, like I said, we squeeze in three trimesters for three years. So they are, what they're really, really good at is learning things. What they're really good at is just being, you know, using their time well. They graduate very confident that they can figure things out. And so, you know, I don't know if every day I have the most high tech uh, program, but I definitely have the, the program that gets people the most fu uh, fundamentals that they need and then on hand experience at sea. 
Uh, we're going to be doing questions from the audience, so if anyone wants to get up to the microphones, please do so now. I'm going to ask one last question to uh, uh, John and Mike here together, and then we'll take uh, uh, questions from the crowd. Uh, watching the situation that unfolded with Dolly as a former Merchant Mariner, I can tell you that the four minutes that crew experienced with the loss of power must have been absolutely the most horrific they that ever had. It was a slow motion event, having sailed on a ship that lost power, sound, you know, quiet is the worst sound you can hear on a ship. And, you know, in many ways, the, the, the dolly slow motion into the bridge, it's kind of representative of the past almost 40, 50 years of U.S. maritime policy where we kind of lost power and then we were slowly careening <laughs> towards a bridge. Uh, and you're all talking about eff efforts we can make, you know, in the short term, long term. If, if you could, what would be a short term, what would be a long term uh, effort you'd want to put forward almost immediately, you think, that can start creating changes based on your experiences and based on what you said? And I know, Jim, you talked, yeah, Mike, to me, you talked about some of them already with uh, TSP and, and the second registry, but if you can just expand on them a little bit. Uh, sure. Go, go ahead. Well, I would um, just underscore what, what Mike said, that um, it's a real threat. Uh, uh, there needs to be kind of a, a, a clarion call from the very top of our government that this is something we need to, need to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the thought leadership um, uh, uh, just needs to be much stronger because, it, and, and uh, clearly, you know, we, uh, under any analysis, uh, with, with the real potential threat we have, and part of it also, people kind of forget that any, any sea lift to China is like three times the distance of the sea lift we were preparing for across the Atlantic. Um, uh, Sal and uh, historians know that the sea lift for the Korean conflict was extraordinarily large, not because it was a big war, but it was just that distance thing. So it's, um, we just need to kind of uh, uh, recognize that we have much more of an Achilles heel than we think. And it's, um, you know, it's with the ships, but it's the entire maritime supply chain. What the, what the Admiral said, I, I underscored the importance of our ports. Um, you know, God forbid China elects to um, attack Taiwan when we've got 110 ships off the coast of California. So I've, I've, uh, I'm a big believer that one of the things we learned with COVID, um, our container ports are moving uh, roughly four times the volume of inbound containers this year than they did in 1995. Uh, basically with the same group of container ports. And they're doing that with a lot of increased productivity and, uh, and, and some incremental uh, uh, expansion, you know, some uh, unused capacity at the time. But a big reason they're doing it is stacking containers ever higher. One of the things that COVID told us is that our container ports are starting to kind of, kind of reach, um, you know, we're closer to that limit and container shipping will continue to grow. So we need to look at that and make sure that under any circumstance, we have the, the sort of flex capacity in our ports. You know, you don't want to have a problem before you can load the ship. So, uh, but to get back to your question, I think the most important thing is, is a, a genuine national strategy as it relates to our commercial maritime, recognizing the very uh, significant national security issue. And, and I think it's really important that the Navy League with the Center of Maritime Strategy has brought two individuals like you on to talk directly about this. Mike? But, sure, well, I, I, I completely agree. I think the most important thing that, that needs to happen now is a, is a fundamental mind sh mindset change. Um, I, uh, retired a couple years ago from a long commercial career with uh, Crowley Maritime and, and uh, uh, dealt with a lot of things. Uh, national security was part of the portfolio, but it was, again, mostly hypothetical concerns that we were dealing with then. I never would have envisioned myself sitting on a stage talking about choke points and, and, and maybe I'm just uh, overly paranoid, but when I see what's, ha when I look at what's happening in, in, the, in the Gulf of Aden, um, it's, it's absolutely outrageous. We have uh, terrorists firing at, at, at commercial ship, shipping, uh, China and Russia getting a, an explicit pass up for their ships, whether they've made mistakes a couple times or not. Um, uh, China having the ability, I believe, to shut it down if they wanted to. Uh, it seems like a bit of a dress rehearsal. Uh, I am skeptical. I don't know what happened in Baltimore, but I'm skeptical about that. I, I think we have 
we have managed our domestic and international maritime industry on an assumption of peace and prosperity and, and goodwill. And, and I love that about America, but we are not living in that world today. And at least we need to plan as if we're not living in that world today, I think. And, and so short term, we need to really ramp up, change our mindset, and then, and then, and then try and get it back. I mean, the, the best outcome for all of this is, is uh, uh, China uh, uh, understanding that we can coexist and, have a, and, and continue having a very successful uh, global uh, economy and, and, uh, and so on. But, but right now, we are so weak, especially in this sector, that we need to, to, to make some fundamental changes. The black swan events are supposed to be rare undertakings, and we, we seem to have a flock of them circling over global shipping, and we just can't get the flock out of here. So it just seems to be a bit of a problem. I'm going to go ahead and go to our audience. Uh, with the young lady first, uh, you identify yourself in the question. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Doris McBride, and I really appreciate hearing your perspectives on this issue. My question has to do with the fact that the U.S. started open registries in the first place. And for whatever reason, they got away from us. But part of the reason we had them was because of situations like what's going on in the Middle East. I'm interested in hearing how you think uh, creating a second registry would be different from our prior experience in terms of open registries. And also, what other ways can the industry be incentivized? Because it's pretty clear that the Jones Act is not having the intended effect, given that the number of vessels we have continue to decline. Thank you. Great question. Can I respond? Um, so so uh, open registries are sort of the, the root problem to all of this. If you look at the aviation industry, the core understanding among nations uh, in aviation is that every country has a sovereign right to determine who does and who doesn't uh, uh, land uh, aircraft in their country and, and what rights they have. In, 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 in maritime, it is uh, thou shalt not discriminate against the flag, uh, and which is just totally opposite. And, and so the maritime industry has been driven by efficiency and has been extraordinarily efficient. And that's been the driver for so many years. Um, how do we turn, can we turn that around? Can we change that paradigm? I think we can. I think that's a bigger lift, a, a longer term lift. Um, with respect to the second registry, it's a blank sheet of paper that, that the US Congress writes what the rules are gonna be. And they can write rules for what, it, what is gonna be re required of ships, not only around safety and environmental issues, but how crew is treated and so on. Ships that are allowed to call in the United States uh, will have to meet those. So you, have a, you, you start with a blank sheet of paper. You can say, uh, ships in the second registry, the crews on those ships have to be trained at a qualified maritime uh, training facility in the United States once every other year or every five years, creating an opportunity to, to really develop centers of maritime excellence in training. Uh, at the union schools and at other schools uh, around the country. So I, I, and then, you know, and then you can phase out, you can phase out a second registry as we have more, Amer more American mariners available uh, to us. But we need to act with urgency today to get as many ships off the board for the other side as we can and put as many U.S. flag, U.S. crewed ships as we can in the water. So it's, it's a bit of a sort of a practical understanding that this is what we're, we're dealing with here. And I'll talk about the Jones Act, but that'll take a couple days. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say one thing uh, about the Jones Act that's very, very important is to contextualize the Jones Act. Everyone focuses on the, the coastal trade aspect, Section 27 of the Act. Section 27, there were 33 other sections. And what the Merchant Marine Act of 1920 was, was a national sea lift strategy as a policy. And what has happened in the 104 years since then is we've basically dismantled sections of that policy over time so that the one remaining section literally left is, is that. And I think we need that kind of holistic look again at what is gonna be our national maritime policy. I think we need to look at everything. I, I think it's, it, 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 it's crazy to think that we're gonna leave everything the way it is and everything will be fine. I also think it's crazy to think that you're gonna peel the bandage off this and you're gonna magically fix it by repealing or leaving the Jones Act. And I think we need that discussion. And we're starting to see that on a congressional level, things like the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, where you get uh, Congressman Garamendi and Congressman Johnson, you know, Democrat and Republican from California and South Dakota to push the first piece of 
reform legislation in terms of the maritime industry since the 1990s almost, uh, I think is, is, is really incredible. And remember, there's a lot of visibility on shipping now, much more than ever before. So I think it's a really uh, important aspect. Jim. Hey, good morning. Um, my name's Jim Watson. I'm the retired Coastie that helped write the book about the 0.4% of the US fleet being US flag. And uh, I, I really want to compliment uh, well the Navy League and, and the people on the stage here for this, this particular session. I think it's very important. I'd love to see everybody at, at, the, uh, at the symposium here be here, but uh, we're having a good discussion. I, I guess I want to start, uh, Sal, this kind of is a little bit to you, because it's historically, uh, my interpretation is that a Navy, a nation's Navy, uh, is there to support national defense, obviously, but also that nation's international trade. Uh, so in other words, the Navy is largely there because you have a merchant marine. It's trading all over the world. Well, nowadays, it seems like that's upside down, where we have a merchant marine that only exists because we, we have to do sea lift, or you know, we have to support the government with that merchant marine. Uh, and you know, I, I, I think that uh, leads to questions about, well, how do we get out of this? Um, and should it be continually just focused on a contingency, or should we really be thinking about uh, international trade and economic security, energy security, food security? Uh, where, where are the shipping and the rest of the world is going with these climate solutions? Um, because maritime is gonna be a big part of all of that and is part of uh, you know, our, our national security, not just from a defense perspective. Um, so my question actually has to do with, I, I'm a glass half full. I agree with John uh, McGowan that, that there's some good signals out there with the TSP and all that. But also I'm seeing some other signals. Um, Operation Prosperity Guardian. Um, there is an agreement apparently that uh, there's no deference between uh, any ship flag in the world in the Red Sea. The U.S. Navy is going to basically spread itself evenly, and the other navies are doing the same. Um, that, that hasn't been the case uh, for most of our history. The U.S. Navy is there to support the U.S. flag ships. We, had a program of reflagging tankers back in the tanker war so that that was consistent with history. The other data point is when NATO was created, uh, the logistics capabilities uh, were provided by each nation uh, and supposedly each nation's navy supported that logistics uh, need. If you're gonna support a NATO operation, obviously you need logistics. Uh, that's being changed also to uh, sort of put everything in a big pool and have all the navies just like uh, um, Operation uh, Prosperity Guardian. So what, what does that send as a signal, I guess, to uh, U.S. merchant mariners and, and, the, and the prospect for uh, where, we, where we're going in the future, uh, you know, with, with our uh, maritime, Navy, um, you know, policy. So that's my question. Yeah, I'll comment and then open up to the, the panel for, for comments. I, I think, you know, one of the things this indicates is the fact that we've lagged behind in our maritime legislation is, you know, basically we're very reactive, not proactive in, in doing this. You're exactly right that, you know, when you go back to the tanker war, we didn't escort tankers until they reflagged over to the U.S. registry in 87. Prior to that, 400 ships were hit, and, and we didn't really intervene at all. Now you have a situation where U.S. ships are bypassing the Red Sea, yet U.S. Navy vessels are largely guarding vessels of the open registries, which, let's be clear, we created the three biggest ones in Panama, Liberia, and the Marshall Islands. Uh, that, that was a U.S. creation that, that, that we did. I, I think it's a very interesting point. Uh, you know, I'm a history professor, so I'm going to give you some homework, you know. You know, you read books like Bruce Jones's To Rule the Waves, where he talks about this idea of great power competition returning back to the world's oceans. And you get that uh, concept 
that we have to rethink how shipping is done. At the same time, I'll also recommend Nick uh, Lambert's uh, most recent book, where he looks at Alfred Thayer Mahan, the man that everybody quotes but no one has ever actually read. Uh, and, and, and he actually goes through Mahan and actually comes away from Mahan with this concept that Mahan's talking about economics. He's talking about trade the entire time. That's the key aspect. And we, we are at a very big paradigm shift right now. The fact that the, you know, we're defending trade on basically you know, international ships more so. Matter of fact, you had instances in the Red Sea where US ships were turned around and actually were, were denied passage, whereas other ships are coming in. So I, I do think we're, we're at a very big inflection point to discuss about where we want international trade. That's why I think when you hear ideas like Mike's talking about, which in the past would be, you know, you never talk about a concept like a second registry. And, and, and even though it's the Norwegians, the Danes, the Brits, a lot of it, and the Portuguese have done this, you know, I, I think we need to start thinking beyond the box in some ways of, of, of talking. And, you know, because uh, again, we've seen these massive ships. Uh, the other book that I'll mention is Mark Levinson's second book, not the box, but his second book on globalization, uh, which talks about how the world has changed in terms of this evolution of international trade. I, I would just panel. say, I would just say on, on the issue yep. of second registry, the, the other countries that have done that have done it for fundamentally different reasons. Uh, they've done it because they they want to maintain some ownership and, and 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 control over shipping, and they they just run up against the economics of, of using their national flag fleets. Uh, we're talking about doing it very explicitly for national and economic security reasons. And, and as I say, we write the rules. We start, from, we start with a blank sheet of paper and we write what the rules are gonna be. And, I, and, and we can phase that out if we need to, but, or if we have the opportunity to. Um, but, uh, but so I, I, I think it's a good idea. It is not the centerpiece of this proposal. No. The centerpiece of the proposal is tripling the size of the US flag, US crude uh, fleet in international trade. And I, I strongly recommend reading the proposal because it is, it is a well-documented, very good proposal. We're running out of time, so real quick, last question. We'll wrap up. Good morning. Uh, my name is Justin Cotter. I'm a Fort Schuyler grad. I'm a Coast Guard reservist and a Coast Guard civilian and an IT guy. Um, and so my question is about the prospects of autonomous vessels. It's super broad, broadly impacting. Um, and to narrow it down uh, slightly, I'm curious about what your perspectives are about the security, what they do to the impacts of security to maritime, to the maritime domain. I'll, so, I'll uh, maybe uh, I'll take a quick ahead. shot at it. Um, my view is that uh, is that uh, cargo ships sh sailing in peacetime will continue to have full complements of, of mariners for the foreseeable future. Um, the, the, uh, the part of the proposal that, that I've made is, is that the ships that we need for sea lift be autonomous ready so that uh, if the flag goes up and if those ships are gonna be headed into harm's way, we can, we can get the crews off and run them uh, autonomously as a matter of crew safety. We don't need to be sacrificing mariners. Uh, it's great that they're willing to sail into harm's way. Let's not, <laughs> let's not do that if we could possibly avoid it. And that's where autonomous uh, operations come in as far as my work is concerned. And yet we're in this interesting period where we're being told by industry that they want to move to autonomous systems. You know, the first sort of shot across the bow metaphorically is SpaceX with their autonomous uh, barges with um, rocket, uh, rocket landers, Falcon um, 9 landers. They're pushing the envelope in terms of not wanting to have any manned systems in the area while they do the recovery, even so much as leaving and returning back to port in an autonomous system. So the Coast Guard's perspective, we started this working group with industry called Autopoco um, because this is gonna be a collaboration between those who are developing these and we who need to understand and then advance common um, standards to assure safety. But I think what we're seeing here in the near, near term is the desire to reduce manning. Use greater autonomy on board so that you have lesser crewing. We have to be very careful about this. We want to make sure, again, we do this internationally. And you're seeing that being done. Norway with a Vard Birkenhead uh, basically operating a very small electrical powered container ship operating between fjords up in Norway. The Koreans and the Japanese are full force in doing this. I think you also have to look on the commercial side at the insurance. I, I, I never foresee a, a 
half a billion dollar container ship sailing across the Pacific with nobody on board. Uh, I, I don't think you get the insurance for it in, in many ways. But I do think that the issue of autonomy and control systems come in too to ensure when we talk about engine propulsion loss that there is that, but then you raise the specter of the cyber becoming even more so. So we are up against time, so I want to take a moment on behalf of the Navy League and thank our, our four panelists for coming out today and providing some expert uh, discussion and points. We could talk about this for hours. I know I can. And, and uh, uh, I, I love Sally this topic. Sally didn't set the clock. so I, I know, I know. We, never, we, we have a 60 minute <laughs> clock up here. So we never had our clock going, so we, we, we didn't have the countdown. So I want to thank everybody for coming out, especially on the last day of CEA Airspace. I know our uh, uh, panels will be up here for a few minutes. So if you have any questions at all, please come up. And again, put on your calendar now, CEA Airspace Expo 25. Uh, go ahead and make your arrangements now. So thank you for coming today. And thank you to the panelists. So, thank you. I appreciate it so much, sir. Yeah. I can't tell you enough.